This week on the Stogie Geek Show, we have a special interview with the one and only Rocky Patel. In our Debonair Ideal segment, we talk coffee and maybe some cigars with Jay Carragay of Squirrel Coffee. And of course, we'll have our Stogies of the Week, so stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. to you by M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are then rolled in Costa Rica by some of the most experienced cigar rollers, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays a detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try the M. Bombay Casera, the M. Bombay Mora, and the recently released M. Bombay Habano. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And by Punch Cigars. For more information, check them out at www.punchcigars.com. Welcome, everybody, to the Stogie Geek <laughs> Show. This is episode 210 for this November 21st, 2016. Will Cooper here, man, actually in Studio C, the reconfigured Studio C in North Carolina. Um, I'm joined tonight by Mr. Stace Berkland. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate no, it. honored to uh, definitely have you on the show tonight. Um, we've been I've actually been wanting to get Stace on as guest host for quite a while. Um, Paul actually was supposed to make his triumphant return tonight, but uh, Paul actually uh, came under the weather, unfortunately. And uh, I know I talked to him Friday, and he, he looked like he was getting better, and then I guess he, his voice took a turn for the worst here. But uh, we were really glad to have Stace here tonight. So, uh, you know, welcome to the Stogie Geeks debut tonight. Appreciate it. Appreciate the invite. Yep. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a... The show's going to be your normal Stogie Geek show, uh, but uh, we'll be doing things a little differently. But first, you know, I want to just uh, acknowledge Mark, Riley, and Tyler up at the Billiger North American Studios in Rhode Island. Apologize for a little bit of delay here. We, we had a little bit of a different configuration set up, and we had to kind of do some triaging and some... Uh, some kind of alternate arrangements, but we're all good right now. Uh, what we're going to do, um, we're going to do something a little different. We're actually going to kick it off tonight with our debonair ideal in a, in a minute, and we're going to bring on Mr. Jay Carragay of Spro Coffee. Uh, we got Jay on the show about two years ago, very knowledgeable in the area of coffee, and uh, thought it would be a really good opportunity to kind of combine that with the debonair ideal. Uh, then Stace and I are actually going to take you through our smokes of the week, and I think we have some pretty good ones to talk about. So that will be the second segment. Uh, we'll then move into a, an interview we did with Rocky Patel. Uh, it was recorded actually a few weeks ago. Stace and I both did that interview. Uh, so we'll, it was a very good interview. Um, really good. And then what we're going to do is we'll have a little bit of a discussion around the interview, kind of organic discussion afterwards there. Um, so what we'll do is uh, let's just uh, take a quick uh, message from our sponsor of the segment, and then we'll get into the interview with Jay. So stay tuned. Right. Like a circle in a spiral Like a wheel within a wheel Never ending or beginning Like the circles that you find In the windmills of your Visit stogiegeeks.com forward slash debonair for a list of retailers who carry debonair cigars. Buy some today and get a little more debonair. Okay, so welcome everyone back to the Stogie Geek Show. Uh, Will Cooper, Stace Berkland in Studio C in North Carolina. And uh, we have on Skype Mr. Jay Carragay of Spro Coffee. Jay, Will Cooper and Stace Berkland here. How are you doing tonight? Oh, doing very well there, guys. Thanks for having me on tonight. Well, welcome back, by the way. I've been wanting to get you uh, back on the show. It's, it's I can't believe it's already two years since you've been on the show. 
I know it's kind of for surprising. I was uh, just thinking about that a couple weeks ago. I was like, wow, it's been two years. It's quite a long time already. Yeah. Now, Jay, you um, you try. I see your travels on social media. You travel a lot. Um, but what is exactly your role with Spro Coffee? Well, uh, the best way to describe the, my role with Spro is uh, pretty much to do everything and support everyone. That's probably the best way to put it. But uh, I, uh, I, of course, I own the company, and so we try to set a nice standard for our guests to enjoy nice quality coffees, and then I oversee training of the staff as well as the roasting of the coffee and also the buying of the coffee in different countries. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have seen you doing the international thing uh, worldwide. Uh, so, I mean, this is not, I know you're based, you're based in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, correct? Yes, that's correct. So, take me a little of the origins. How did you kind of get started with this company? And take us maybe a little through what's, what makes Bro Coffee unique and distinct. Well, it was, I kind of fell into the coffee business. I had been in motion picture production for 10 years throughout the 90s. And then I decided to transition out of that and get into frozen desserts here in Baltimore. And then somehow that after 9-11, we had to move to a new location. Which before that we were seasonal, and so we needed to become year-round. And it was a matter of what can we do when our frozen desserts aren't selling well in the winter time. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, let's do coffee. Uh, Starbucks was kind of big, and just so happens that I fell in with uh, certain people from the specialty coffee industry that were happy enough to bring me under their wing and teach me things about the coffee business and. It's taken its own turn from there. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, so, a little about uh, what what are some of the products, the main products you offer? Well, mainly we, we for the retail shop. Of course, we offer brewed coffees as well as espresso drinks, and then um, other drinks uh, for the customers, um, teas, uh, sodas, things like that. But our real focus, of course, is coffee. So. We spend a lot of time working with farmers in different producing countries, uh, finding nice quality coffees to import to the United States and then roast and bring here for everybody. So, Jay, this is Stace, and I apologize. I, I don't have a lot of background on your company, but I am a, I'm a big coffee fan. Um, what are some of the countries that you center around uh, in terms of the coffee offerings? Do you have particular countries that you work closer with? And then second question would be um, the coffee bean. You know, there's this debate about if you're a true coffee connoisseur, you'd go more for the light roast, medium roast, because you get more of the flavor. Other people say, no, dark roast is where it's at. Can you kind of... Uh, give us a little lesson there on Coffee 101 on those two things. Sure. I think it's, um, well, for, to answer the first part of your question, where we focus on for our direct buying has been mainly in Central America. So we work with farmers in, in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, uh, Honduras, El Salvador, and then we do a little bit of buying from Mexico and Guatemala. Okay. And then we, all, we also have a relationship with a farmer in uh, the Philippines. And then we do some buying of coffees from uh, African countries, mainly Ethiopia and uh, Uganda. Okay. And then, so to add to the second part of your question about the roasting part of it, um, I liken it to cooking steak. So you have steaks that are cooked uh, rare, medium rare, and then well done. Uh, and coffee is very similar, so you can stay in the medium, rare, medium part of the roasting spectrum, and it really kind of highlights a lot of the flavors that are inherent in the bean. Then once you move into the darker side of roasting, it becomes, um, it brings out a lot more of the toasty notes, and then you leave it imparts some of the roasting characteristics, so you can get a little more of a char, a little more of a, for lack of a better term, burn, just like you would with a steak. So you can have a, a steak that's very nice and medium or really well done. And I, you know, for me personally, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a customer or a client that's interested in, in all the spectrum. So we actually offer coffees roasted in a very light medium and then a relatively uh, oily and dark. 
Okay. So using the state metaphor, I mean, because uh, most of my friends, they're, they're a lot of uh, heavy, heavy coffee drinkers and they like the dark roast. Um, I, I, tend, I tend to like the, the, the lighter and medium roast myself, but using your steak metaphor, uh, a steak snob would say that if you, weld, if you take a petite filet and cook it well done, you've basically butchered the steak. Is that, a, is that not true in the um, coffee room? Coffee <coughs> Or, or is that a similar uh, fair fair analogy? I think that's a fair, roughly fair analogy. I mean, you're going to, you know, it, it's kind of like one of those things where you, you, if you have flavors and nuances in the medium section of, of the roasting or the steak, yeah. and you go past that and into the more of the darker roasting and charring or, or well done, you know, you're, you're, you're cooking away some of those elements, you know, but you're also going into the spectrum of flavors that some people really enjoy. So right. I think the real key there is, like with, with a lot of companies, they'll do dark roasts, and then what they'll do is that they'll tend to buy lower quality coffees and use that because they think, well, it doesn't really matter because the people don't care. Um, what we tend to do is we, we've essentially used the same quality coffees or the same exact coffees that we're roasting of medium, and we'll take it darker for the the darker coffees, um, and I believe that it just ha it still has a much better quality of uh, cup flavor than than it would if you use a cheaper coffee. Got it. Got it. Thanks. No. Thanks, Dave. Some of the uh, so one thing you mentioned a lot of those regions, and and I and again I'm coming at this from a novice, so a lot of times I hear about mountain grown coffees. What makes coffee like conducive to being grown in a higher altitude climate why is it better and if, if that's true at all oh that's a good that's really interesting um there are coffees that are grown at different altitudes ideally most people will tend to agree that coffees above 1000 meters is better quality than below um, there's so much more factors involved with that. For example, there's this region in Costa Rica called the Tadazu region, and it's very popular. It's very high quality. We get a number of our coffees from there, um, and it ranges in altitudes from, I believe, it, the lowest part is about 1,200 meters, upwards of 1,800 meters. And several, maybe about 25 years ago, there was a lot of forest there, and over the years, they've they've cut down the forests to cultivate that land for coffee. Back in the older days, when it was still forest, there was a lot of fog that essentially covered the upper, the upper parts of the mountains, so maybe 1,500 meters and up. That was actually very um, detrimental to the quality or to the growth of coffee, so it wasn't very favorable. But by clearing away the, the, the forest in favor of coffee trees, that fog cap is no longer no longer happens. So it's actually very nice quality coffees at, at all out elevations in that region now. So a lot of people say that most of the coffee that you deal with from Central America tend to be mountain grown. Uh, there's some very little lowland coffee, especially if you're buying on the, uh, the nicer quality scale of coffees. Uh, not too much lowland coffees are available in that, that spectrum. When you source, or actually when you blend coffee, let's say, I'm going to kind of put my cigar analogy hat on, and you can tell me if this is right or wrong. Do you have a notion of, like, puro coffees and then coffee blends of multiple types of uh, regional coffees? Oh, absolutely. Um, so in the puro spectrum, so you're probably familiar with how Pete Johnson at Tatuaje has been doing these Verite series from certain vintages, from only leaves from the, a certain farm. Um, in the coffee world, there's uh, something we call single origin, which is very similar to that. And, you know, you're talking about um, one farm. It could be right down to one plot of land, maybe whatever size that plot may be. It may be only an uh, acre or two acres or maybe up to five acres. And uh, those single origin coffees will be specific for that, that, uh, that location. And then you move into blending, and uh, the blending really kind of depends on what you're looking for. So 
Uh, as an example for us, let's say with our espresso blend, uh, I personally like more chocolatey, bassy tones with um, some fruitiness and uh, nuttiness on the finish. So we, as we're buying coffees in the countries, we're looking for coffees that fit those flavor, flavor profiles, and then we'll blend them, we'll roast them and blend them together um, to create that blend. So very similar to how um, a blender for one of the cigar companies will take the leaves, uh, maybe the different fermentation levels and uh, whatever specifications they have, varieties or locations, and they'll blend those together to form a unique whole. Which, uh, I mean, which do you think is, is there, is it kind of just, there's not really one preferred way over another, at least as far as your best practices go? Well, for us, it's, um, it's not really, for us, we, we actually go both ways in that we like to work with some, with our farmers to really showcase what they can produce on a single origin level. So a lot of the coffees that we offer our single origin, just from one farm, just from one lot, uh, a lot that we think is really, really exciting to us. And then, like I said, the other ones will, will blend together to for a variety of purposes. So it could be like our espresso blend, or it could be for the Fratello blend that we do for uh, for Omar. Yeah, and you, you kind of, uh, yep, that was my next thing. Perfect segue. Yeah, perfect segue. So I know we did talk a little about it the last time. In fact, we, we brewed up some of the Fratello coffee, which I got really hooked on, actually, Stace. This is something you need to check out. Can you tell, for folks maybe, you know, hadn't heard the story, how did you kind of get hooked up with Omar, and what was that project all about with the Fratello coffee? Well, it was um, about three years ago. Uh, my local tobacconist is a place called uh, Faders in uh, Towson, Maryland. And a good friend of mine was working there as one of their tobacconists, a, a guy by the name of Tony Masato. And one day, as Omar was beginning his, uh, his march across America, he came by the shop and introduced himself to Tony. And I happened to come in that day. And so Tony was like, well, you know, when he wanted to introduce us. And Omar was very much interested in building complementary relationships with other companies to highlight the Fratello cough, the, the Fratello uh, cigar, which I'm actually smoking now, the, uh, the, for, the original line Fratello Robusto. And this was the, actually, this was the cigar that we started to blend with for the coffees. We, um, we basically sat down with the cigar. I brought a whole bunch of different coffees, single origin coffees together. We laid them all out, and um, very much how a blender, um, such as Arsenio at uh, Evan Orson will do, he'll sit there with all the little um, flavors of tobaccos, and we tasted them. We would taste each one, each coffee individually, and then put little scoops together into a cup, taste that, taste the smoke, taste, and then eventually came up with the blend that we, that we liked, um, and that Omar really liked. And so we've been working on constantly creating that every year. And just like in cigars, with every year having a new crop of tobacco, that you have to find a way to blend and create the same consistent flavor profile, it's very similar to coffee in that respect. Yeah, I, I tell you, that was, a, that was I would call it, a, a solid medium roast coffee, I remember. And uh, you haven't had a chance to try it, Stace. I haven't yet. Yeah, that's uh, you, you definitely need to try that as well. Uh, have you done? Are there any other like? Um, I guess would you call that a private label? It's not really a private label, but have you done any other projects? Maybe where you you pair a coffee with something else, another genre or something? Uh, we've really done. A, well, outside of the cigar business. We've uh, worked with a local, more local companies here in Baltimore, like uh, the Charmery, which is uh, a local ice cream company, where the idea was to make a, a coffee ice cream where instead of just being like a, this generic like coffee flavor, we want it to be very specific. So while we have single origin coffees that are really beautiful and have really unique characteristics, the idea was how can we transfer those characteristics on the coffee into the coffee ice cream so that you could line 
you know, different coffee ice creams together and actually taste the uniqueness of each coffee in those. And then the other twist that, that I added to it that I really wanted to, to see if we could achieve it was, can we do that without imparting the, the brown color of coffee? Like, coffee as an ingredient is a wonderful thing, but the most difficult part, from a, I think, from a culinary aspect is that it makes everything brown. And so how could we make the flavor, how can we flavor the coffee, I mean, how can we flavor the ice cream with the coffee and still keep it looking like vanilla? Yeah, good point. Good point. You have another question? or? I mean, I've got a lot of questions. I just don't know how, how much to ask. Um, <laughs> with regard to your, your beans, you had talked about Guatemala, you talked about Nicaragua, Costa Rica, etc. It sounds like you've got a, a wide palette of, of product to choose from. Uh, what are some of your more popular uh, regions? Like, I, I have to believe you've got like a, a number one, number two, number three. What are some of your top sellers? Um, our, the way that we work is a little bit different in that um, we do have, we actually have a menu at the shop here in Baltimore where you can come in and it's very much like a wine menu. So there's, uh, right now there's 10 different coffees on the menu at different price points. And you can have those prepared for you at, at any time and um, in a different ways of preparation to highlight or, or um, diminish certain flavor aspects of that coffee. So it, it's it, – it, and then we also have a coffee that most people call the house coffee. And that coffee is, of course, going to be the most popular one because it's at, our, at the most um, entry-level price point. For us, it's $3 a cup. And um, right now, that's a, an El Salvador coffee from a place called uh, Finca Tonamica in the Upper Neca region. And that's a really interesting coffee because the, the husband and wife that produce the coffee, the husband, Herman, is actually um, a pediatric guy, in uh, the doctor in the Bronx. And he, since the 1980s, when the, the Civil War in, the, in El Salvador was going on, he was a, a doctor there who's been at the very forefront of um, infant um, AIDS research and AIDS prevention for um, for children. So he's really been, you know, he, in addition to making beautiful coffees, he's done like this amazing hum humanitarian work for for the people. But right now, that's probably the most popular coffee that we have. Got it. Um, are there certain? And, and I don't know the answer. I'm asking because I'm wanting to learn. Are there certain? Uh, coffee beans that lend themselves to having a, a better flavor in the espresso realm of coffee as opposed to what we would consider a normal cup of coffee or, or, or a cup of coffee here in the States? Well, the really interesting thing that I found, and um, I think that maybe the, the, the listeners who've, um, who've actually had the opportunity to try uh, visiting the, the, the cigar or tobacco farms um, is that you'll find in, a, in one, in, in, let's say one average coffee farm that we work with, there are different lots that come out of that farm. It's not, and those, those groups of coffees may come from different physical locations in the farm with different microclimates, and those will have very different flavors. So the profile from one coffee from the same from from one farm, and then these other coffees from the same farm may taste completely different. So uh, it's not it's it's become more difficult to say simply that oh that all coffees from Guatemala may taste a certain way and may be conducive to to going with cigars. Um, I think how we approach it for us is that we let's say we're we're blending for the Fortello cigar or. For someone else that's asking us to, to do a, a cigar pairing coffee, where right. we want to taste the we want to taste the cigar, and then really understand the flavors of that cigar, and then try to find complementary flavors in the different coffees that are available to uh, pair with that. Okay, so really it can come from a variety of places or even a variety of locations on one farm. Interesting. Will Cooper, Stace Berkelin here at Studio C in North Carolina. We're talking to Jay Cargay of Spur Coffee. Jay, I'm going to ask a question here. It's kind of probably, probably piss everyone off, but I'm just kind of really curious. Decaffeinated coffee, 
is my first question is that something you deal with but second of all what is exactly a process of removing caffeine i've never kind of understood what exactly happens during that process well you know i've been in the business now 15 years and the miss the uh, the exact process of decaffeination is still a bit of a mystery to me but how i've been explained to it is um well there, first of all there's a there's a couple major methods of doing it. There is um, chemical processes like methylene chloride, where they um, where they would say strip the caffeine out using this chemical, and then and that's usually done in Germany. Then in Mexico and in Canada, they have varying types of um, water process decaffeination, and essentially, my understanding of those is that they take the coffee in a green raw state. They put it into a hot water bath, which strips the flavor as well as the caffeine out of the bean. Then they run that heavy water and separate the caffeine out of it. And then take that flavor laden water and then run that back and soak the beans in it and dry it so that the flavor soaks back into the beans and then they bag and ship it back. And the hard part with that is that in order to do it in a, economical way, you have to do a minimum of like a container load, which is roughly 40,000 pounds. So in order to do that for really nice and high quality coffees, it takes a considerable amount of money to do that. And a lot of the coffee companies like myself, or uh, even some of the bigger ones that, that you might have heard of, uh, it's very difficult for them to in put that kind of investment into, into a decaffeinated product. Um, but recently, we were able to find um, one of our growers in Nicaragua who actually, uh, they've, they've kind of invested in, in taking a, a number of their coffees, sending them to, through the, the decaffeination process with Swiss water in uh, Canada, and um, then they, they offer that now as part of their catalog. And so we've been, we just started using some of their stuff, and um, it's turned out really well because the hard part is that most places will um, will buy well, well. Most companies will decaffeinate uh, lower quality coffees um, because it's more economical, and they can offer it at a price point that most coffee roasters will roasters will find um, appealing. And then, um, and the problem with that, well, the thing is that the interesting thing about that is if you take a lower quality coffee and you decaffeinate it, the caffeine has a bitter, con you know, a bitter flavor to it. So it actually makes the coffee sweeter. So a, a lower quality coffee tastes better decaffeinated, and so they can they can pass it a little bit better that way. Where now we're trying to get it so that we can use really high quality coffees that are decaffeinated and they're actually tasting really really well now. You, you know, Jay, what you you kind of said something that I I had heard. So ten years ago, my wife and I we took a trip to Hawaii and we were on the Big Island. And, you know, obviously we went to the coffee plantations and, and, you know, I was going to buy some coffee and uh, it was at a coffee shop and they had Kona decaffeinated coffee, which one was significantly more expensive, but two, the person there was really trying not to sell me this coffee and was explaining that basically all the coffee in Hawaii has to, had to be shipped off the island and back. So they were actually trying to talk. They said, you know, you can get some, but, you know, if you look up, they felt it wasn't living up to that Kona flavor. Um, and, they, and it was exactly the same answer you gave me as well on that, which I kind of feel good. I just wonder if they were just trying to sell me the other bag of coffee at the time. <laughs> I mean, yeah. They probably, if, you know, if, if with some of the Konas, that, that they're quite pricey. So they might have also been trying to sell you that other bag. But, um, you know, the, the problem It was good when they sold me. So, yeah. Right. I mean, the problem historically with the decaf coffee is, is that um, in some ways you're, you're not really sure what you're getting, meaning that like since they're rehydrating and reflavoring your coffees, it may or may not have been the bean that you started with. Um, in, in, in the past, that may not have been very critical, you know, because um, a lot of that was for commercial purposes um, for the really, really large uh, grocery style coffee chains. Um, that you find on the on the grocery store aisles, um, but now with the, a lot of this new generation of coffee producing, where the flavor is a major component, you know, uh, like a like a cigar is very important, with the, especially cigar flavors. 
Uh, now that's a different story. So we're trying to find ways to uh, preserve that quality of the bean. And you know, when you look at the the green coffee from in a green natural state, and then you look at the green coffee after the decaffeination process, there's a, a because of that the hot water temperature and the stripping of the flavors and the rehydrating and the reflavoring, there's a bit of structural damage to that coffee. So it's a little bit more difficult to deal with and it can lead to some deterioration of the quality overall as well. A question I have, Jay, this is Stace. Um, I like smoking and drinking coffee. Uh, in the morning, it's mild. Uh, afternoons, medium. And then after dinner, fuller. Um, I'm not familiar with your brands, but I want to get familiar with your brands. So I want you to shoot three type of sprue coffees that, that I should look at. One that would pair well with the Davidoff 2000 in the morning. Uh, something that would pair well with a Ford de la Antilla medium bodied in the afternoon. And then something that would pair well with, with a fuller bodied smoke in the evening. Okay, so I would say that um, in the morning we have this, like I said there was earlier, there was this coffee called the Finca Tonamica. And it's an El Salvadorian coffee. I think that would be really, really nice with your um, Davidoff 2000 in the morning. Um, then for more of a medium bodied, there's this coffee that we have from um, Costa Rica. It's called the uh, it's called the Ortiz 1800. Uh, really nice flavors, uh, medium bodied, really beautiful like complexity. Um, produced by actually three sisters in the Tarazu region. Um, so really, really interesting family to work with. And then for the evening, I would say maybe take a, a nice blend. We have a, like our, the, the Fratello blend that we're producing now, which is in many ways very similar to our espresso blend, um, just not with as heavy a roast, um, really has a lot of complexity, um, good body. Um, I think can stand up really well with a, a strong cigar, um, I think that might be the best way to go. Okay. Appreciate the insight. I'll check those out. All right. So, so Jay, we have a good question from Steve, uh, who's one of our regular listeners, and he wanted to know if you have an example of a type of coffee that you have and what would be the best way to brew it. Ah, okay, great. So here at the shop, when you come in uh, as a customer, like I said, we have a menu, and... Um, We've actually taken the time to pair that coffee with a certain method of brewing that we think best highlights that coffee. So let's say like, um, for example, the uh, what we call the Night Watch, which is our darker, darkest roasted coffee. We tend to brew that with a French press because the people that want that dark roast, they want that heavy flavor, they want a lot of like body. Um, the French press really brings that through. Uh, but the best way to think about it, or at least the way that I think about it, with different brew methods, whether they're using pour-over, French press, Chemex, Aeropress, um, and the litany of uh, brewing devices that are out there, is that I equate it to, to cooking again. So if you take chicken and you boil it, you broil it, you fry it, you grill it, um, you saute it, it still tastes like chicken, but the way that the cooking method um, will enhance or diminish certain aspects of the chicken. Um, so I tend to think of brewing coffee in the same way. So you can use different brew methods to highlight or diminish different characteristics. So it really kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, it also depends um, on ease or complexity. So like, for example, uh, when I'm at home brewing coffee, usually it's in the morning when I'm making breakfast and I have this really kind of strange penchant where I want everything to be prepared all at once at the same moment. So I'm frying eggs, I'm frying bacon, I'm toasting bread, um, I'm getting all that ready and I'm trying to time it so that it all comes together at the same moment. So and because I, I work on coffee, I have this great selection of brewing devices that I can use at home, I end up using the French press only because you put the coffee in the brewer, you put the hot water in, and then you wait four minutes, and that's the end of it. Whereas everything else needs more attention. So I know. So I can put that and have four minutes to, to do everything else and plate and get ready to eat. Um, 
But is that necessarily the best coffee for everyone? Every coffee, not necessarily. Um, I do use it for pretty much every coffee I brew at home because I'm looking more for ease rather than flavor accuracy. I hope that answers the question that he's asking. I I, I got it. Yep. Okay. Coffee, when you grind beans, there's different, you can do them coarse or you can do them fine. What are some of the differences as far as when would you want to make it more coarse, when would you want to make it more fine? What are the kind of the cases for that? The best way to think about it is um, the idea of brewing coffee is that you want to have hot water right around 200 degrees and you want to use that water as the mechanism to extract the flavors out of your, your beans. Now, let's say in a pour over method or which would like a home coffee brewer, like a Mr. Coffee or those where you put the, the coffee on the top and you set it and you hit the button and it brews. Um, that's what we would call like pour over or pass through method, right? So the water is constantly flowing through the grinds into the cup. In a French press, you have the coffee and the water sitting together for four minutes for the entirety of the brewing process. So in a situation where, okay, so for, you want to have only so much coffee flavor extracted out of those beans, okay? So with a, something like a French press where the coffees and the coffee and the water are mingling for the entire time, you want to go for a larger coarse grind because that slows down the amount of, of flavor solubles that are that are spread into the water. As you go down, as you go into more of the pour methods where the, where the water passes through the coffee, you want to go to a medium cell grind and that allows resistance to the water but also for it to pull out the flavors. So if you did a, if you did a coarse like French press grind in one of those flow-throughs, you would get very watery coffee. But if you did a medium grind, like you would for a through, pour-through, in a, in a French press, you get a very bitter coffee. Okay, So that's kind of how we try to tell people to think about it. So you want to create a, a little bit of resistance, and you want, to, you want to slow down how much solubles are put into the coffee water. Um, did I cover all the bases of that? Yeah. No, I mean, that was, okay. uh, that was for me, that was a very educational, actually. So, so you're saying for, for the French press, make sure I understand, for the French press, you want a coarse, more coarse grain, and then for the pour-through, like the Mr. Coffee, you want more fine grain. Is, is, did I catch it right? That is correct. That is correct. All right. Thanks. Just learned something. Thanks. No, me too. Me too. Absolutely. Absolutely. But another thing to think about is, um, like, a lot of people that come to our shop that are our guests, they ask... They ask us, well, how do I, how much coffee do I need to use? And, um, you know, it's really, you know, here at the shop, we, we do it very technically. So we weigh everything with scales and portion control and weigh the water and do all this stuff to, to make it, you know, um, more consistent and technically accurate. But at home, you know, a lot of people have a hard time, you know, if I, if someone asks, well, how can I make better coffee at home? And the first thing I tell them is, you know, it's it's be helpful to get a better to get a scale. Um, so if you're willing to get a scale, and the best thing to do is to um, use weight as your guide instead of using scoops. Um, so, like say for the average coffee cup, so like a 12 ounce cup like this, you know, a lot of people may use two scoops or one scoop. No, about two scoops, two scoops, and two coffee scoops of uh, whole bean coffee. Um, but for, uh, for a 12 ounce cup, we'll use 24 grams. And the basic ratio that we use here is for every ounce of coffee that you want to make, use two grams of uh, coffee and um, ground to whatever preference that you like. And that's, that's kind of the best way to, uh, to get the consistency and probably better quality brewing. And then, um, of course, the other side of it is to have the right temperature of water, so about 200 degrees. Um, if you can get um, nice filtered water, that's probably going to improve your, your cup quality as well. 
with and I'll, I'll ask this, and you could just poo poo it. But so you know, pod based coffee makers have become popular right now. Now you have the ability where you can basically put your own coffee into some of these. Is there any best practices with pod based uh, the pod based machines? Do you recommend them? Don't recommend them? How, if you do, how would you recommend working with them? Well, you know, I, I'm in the coffee business and uh, especially in so it's kind of like one of those things. Where, when you ask, uh, I guess if you were to say to Drew, to Drew, um, to Jonathan True, and said to him, "Hey, what do you think about Romeo and Cleopatra's? Would you recommend those?" You know. So, uh, but whatever. I, well, the other side of it is that I do realize that a lot of people that are using the the pods or the uh, the curry cups, the K cups, are doing it out of convenience. You know. Actually, my father, a couple of years back, you know, he, my, I asked my mom, I said, hey, you know, what do you think dad would like for Christmas? And he's, she's like, well, you know, he really wants to buy one of those cake cups. So if you bought one of those for him, that'd be really great. You know, and so there's, uh, there's my time to, to reflect on, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to cave and buy my dad this cake cup machine? Which I did, you know, um, I really don't have a problem with it. Um, one of the things I think about with the cake, with those type of systems is... You know, there's if you're looking for really, really like quality coffees, um, they're usually not found in those systems mainly because there's just not enough uh, space for the right amount of coffee to fill the cup. And then also, um, one of the things to consider is I read a report not too long ago that said that if you're buying coffee in a cup, those those cups they tend to be about $65 a pound when you, when you, weigh, when you weigh it all out and, and you price it out. So it's not necessarily uh, the cheapest, or, you know, it's not an economical way to go, but it is a very, very convenient way. Um, you know, you basically, you, as you know, you push it in and you hit the button and it does everything for you. Um, so I really don't have, I don't really have too much against it. I mean, I understand why people use it. Um, some of the people that we know in the industry have brought up a lot of the environmental concerns about it. Like now there's billions of these little plastic cups floating around the landfills. Um, if that, if that, you know, it's kind of a question of whether that's, that, that makes, makes a difference in your mind. Um, you know, but I, I do understand that a lot of people use it because it's a, a very convenient product in the morning. Yeah. I mean, they do have the, the reusable, the refillable baskets that you could put in there now. So I guess they, they've had a – and that's what I liked about that. I'm not a big fan of the pod, and I don't have a machine, but I, I do like having that option of putting my own ingredients in there, so to speak. Yeah, I've seen those. I haven't had the chance to really try those yet. Um, I probably should go to my dad's house and, uh, and take his and try it out. <laughs> I got one more question. Do you have another? Okay. Oh, so, so my last question is where could folks – Find Stro Coffee, like if because we get a lot of on Stogie Geeks, folks want to know where they can get some. Where where is the best? You know, are there places you have a website where where it can be bought, or what would be the best way to, to kind of find your coffee? Well, the best way to do it, I mean, we we have um, uh, if you if you have a Fratello retailer, you can ask them to order some through uh, Omar and their their supply chain. Um, excuse me, you can also try. Um, if you're down in the, te- in the Houston, Texas area, they're actually serving our uh, our Fratello blend at um, Stogie's World Famous Cigar Place, El Bar Westheimer yes. Road. And then, um, other than that, you can come to Baltimore, and we'll be happy to, to serve you. We do have a website. Um, I have to admit that we're very slow to update, and we're kind of behind on that. And the copies that you may see listed on the website tonight are no longer available. Um, we need to really work on that. But if, if you happen to send me an email through this website or something and say, hey, you know, I'm really interested in, in trying some coffees, I can send you, you know, information about what we have, what's available, and a little bit of the flavor notes to, uh, and then we can put together an order for anyone that may be interested. Awesome, awesome. Jay Carragay, Spro Coffee. Um, he's one of the best in the business. Jay, I know you travel a lot, so I, I can honestly say if you're up in Rhode Island or North Carolina, you have a home to stop by and stop by the show. We'll, we'll film something. We'll, I missed out when you were in the studio last time, but uh, I really appreciate the time you made. Apologize for a little delay getting you on tonight. And uh, 
you know, keep up the great work. It was great to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Coop. It's been an honor to be here with you guys tonight. It's very really exciting. Thank you so much. Yeah, Paul's going to be jealous, so he's, I know he's listening at home, by the way. Hopefully he's not drinking tea. Well, hello to you, Paul, and, and thank you, Stace, as well. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back with Stogies of the Week, so stay tuned. Mm-hmm. 